Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on the Jokovic drama because it sort of plays into, I mean, Australia's rules are, I think, ridiculous. Fortress yeah. Australia, they are way over well, the they top. they don't work either. Mel Melbourne is the most uh, locked down city on earth. Th these restrictions, these draconian restrictions have not worked. That said, uh, we cannot yeah, have a situation rules. where VIPs are given special measures, can we? So I'm really torn on this from several perspectives. One, of course, I have a sister trapped in Australia who I can't go and see. Um, but we've all moaned, you and I included, across the last year about the one rule for them and one rule for us and COP26 and barbecues on the beach and parties in the garden because it's just so hypocritical. Mm -hmm. So from a Djokovic point of view, from that perspective, waiving the rules for an elite athlete, wherever it is, Australia or anywhere, is wrong. It has to be because it is their rules, yeah. as you say. And, you know, so you have to stick to them. Yeah. How they let him go there is beyond me because surely all of this will have been ironed out beforehand. So I think there's a bit of politics going on and he is being used as a pawn. Mm. But for me, the reason I support Djokovic is I support his right not to declare his medical I totally agree. I've history. Said, I totally agree. I've said that all along. Uh, you, you know, you have every right not to tell anyone whether or not you've been vaccinated. Uh, the indications are he hasn't been. Uh, and you have every right not to be vaccinated Absolutely. as well. But uh, if you're going to go to somewhere like Australia, that, as he is finding out, will I present know. problems. Um, but it's interesting, though, because in America, they've had this issue with sports stars. They've had all of the NFL players, some of whom have taken hits of $14 million from their salary, but they've now relented. So yeah. America are now giving way and actually allowing them to play because they can't not have them in you know, yeah. their sports. And hopefully that's what's going to happen. They're going to see that this is unworkable. Same, same for uh, professional football here. Yes. I mean, uh, players can be unvaccinated, but they obviously have to test a lot. Yes. I mean, that would be the logical thing yes. for, uh, uh, not, what, the, what do they call it, uh, uh, Novak no uh, Djokovic. Um, that would be the logical thing, but that's... Uh, Logic isn't playing a big part in Australia's in approach anything. to uh, the COVID crisis. I think it? what's been really worrying is the language that's been used in the newspapers today. Mm. You know, splashed across front pages, we've got anti-vaxxer Djokovic. Yeah. You know, and it's really divisive and it's labelling people. And you know, He's not an anti-vaxxer. Uh, he's, he, he's indicated, uh, he never said it actually right flat out, but he's indicated that he feels... He doesn't need the vaccine yes, he's because had he's had COVID. He's a super fit athlete. He, 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 he eats a kind of macrobiotic diet uh, and he's probably got a point, but that doesn't make him an anti-vaxxer. Exactly. And that's what's worried me more today when I've looked I at the papers. With you. I agree. It's been really vile, actually. And I think it's vile and it's mm. divisive and it is setting people mm. against each other. Yeah. See, I get called an anti-vaxxer and all I say is that, look, as far as I'm concerned, if you choose not to have the vaccine, that is your utter right. If you choose uh, not to want to tell anyone you've had the vaccine, that is your utter right. And if you want to have the vaccine, that is your utter right as well. Yes. Uh, and for that, I get called an anti-vaxxer. Why is that anti-vaxxer? Well, I do too, and I've had the vaccine. So apparently I'm an anti-vaxxer because I oppose vaccine mandates yeah. and I oppose vaccinating children. So, so that brings me on to... Uh, what I want to talk about with you because I spotted an old tweet of yours about medical apartheid. It's been retweeted about 40 million times now. <laughs> I think you put it out in November. The madness of vaccine passports. You know, why two and a half months after uh, Queen Nicola Killjoy of Scots Sturgeon <laughs> brought in uh, vaccine passports, you, you know, you had to show health documents to get into football matches and uh, theatres, cinemas and the like pubs, I think, as well up there. Uh, um, they recorded their highest mm. number of COVID cases in a single day ever, over 20,000. It is absolutely clear. Uh, also, the same situation in Wales. Uh, their case mm -hmm. numbers are higher than here. Absolutely clear that both these countries, their vaccine passport systems have completely and utterly spectacularly failed. Uh, in the light of that, in the knowledge of that, Boris Johnson imposed them on us. Where yeah. is the logic in that? It's madness. I mean, there was a story in The Lancet, which I think is a respectable medical journal. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. You have, good. Um, it's a bit like The Sun. You never it? know now. Page three, go, yeah. <laughs> you never know. Um 
on the 31st doctors. of December, 89% <laughs> of all vaccinations were now in doubly or triple vaxxed patients. I can tell you anecdotally as a GP that every single person that I spoke to today who has COVID is triple jabbed today. Now, that's not every day. Now, I'm not knocking the vaccines when I say that. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is it's very evident that it's the vaccinated as well as the unvaccinated who are spreading this disease. Therefore, a vaccine passport is absolutely meaningless. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that he should lift those soon. I mean, he's talking about there are vague hints in the air that uh, within a month he'll lift even the Plan B restrictions, which one would hope would include yeah. the vaccine passports because there was no logic to them being imposed on us in the first place. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, don't bet the farm on it. You know what this situation Absolutely. is. Absolutely. And the pressure he's under. Yeah, indeed, indeed. But he's showing good signs of mm. uh, staying strong. Uh, let's talk about the NHS. Uh, um, this is something that, that interested me. The, the inconvenient truth... Uh, so we're talking about the NHS mm -hmm. being overwhelmed and, you know, the fact that NHS waiting lists are likely to double by 2025 we're not going to cure this waiting list problem not with this nhs we've got to reform no. this nhs but the one we've got now we will never get rid of these waiting lists they will get worse and worse and worse that's a fact but the inconvenient truth is as they go oh my god with covid and the f winter and the flu and the, you know it's classic midwinter overwhelmed and all that turns out that uh, there were more patients in hospital uh, before COVID two years ago than there are now. Yeah. I mean... So I looked at some stats today and I think we've got about 18% of beds unoccupied at the moment as we stand. Now that would suggest to you and I that there's plenty of space and they're not overwhelmed, but they are overwhelmed. And they're overwhelmed for many reasons. Uh, but two of the main ones are obviously that care homes have been crumbling because we're firing staff so, and seeing so the police. poor residents have to be moved into hospitals. Absolutely. 10,000 of those sitting in hospital who don't need to be there. But also we've got such high levels of staff absence now because of COVID and because of burnout they're not and ill, stress. They're just tested positive. They've tested positive that, you know, they haven't got the staff to man those beds. And, and you know, what we have, a, a, if you like, an epidemic of right now is Omicron. Yeah. Omicron makes you ill for a couple of days. Uh, you know, don't feel that great. Hmm. But it's not going to kill you. It's very unlikely to put you in hospital. Uh, um, you know, what, can't we learn to live with this? Well, we have to learn to live with it, don't we? I mean, we've been saying this well, for such a long time. we're not at the moment, are we? I know, but we have to. I mean, Omicron is, as we, you and I both said, I think... <clears throat> excuse me, back in December, hopefully the end of the pandemic, mm. because everybody's going to have it. In a month's time, everybody will have had it who hasn't had it. Mm. And anybody vulnerable, hopefully, will have been protected by their mm. vaccines. Sadly, some people are still going to die. I think we had about 176 deaths today. Mm. It's inevitable. And unfortunately, we cannot stop mm. every single person from dying. And I, I mean, you know, it's a very hard and kind of almost uh, ruthless thing to say. But I think one of the problems uh, of the COVID crisis is we've lost, or many people have lost the, the kind of adult ability to accept the inevitability of death. Yeah. And the government seems to have taken it, uh, taken upon itself the role of the anti-death league. We will save you all from dying. Well, they won't. And uh, it's horrible that 176 people died. Uh, but uh, given that, uh, what was it, at one point over a 1,000 a day were dying. Yeah. This is 176, I think a couple of days ago it was 45, and I saw 78 the other day, 100, 176 is bad, but these are figures we have to accept. Uh, that is just a fact of life. Death is a fact of life, right? I once gave a lecture at medical school about death, and what if nobody ever died? And it, imagine it. I mean, where would we all go? Mm. How would we feed everybody? <laughs> what would the world look like if nobody died? <laughs> Unfortunately, people do have to die. It's part of living. Yeah. Dying is part of living. Yeah, death and taxes, the only two inevitabilities. <clears throat> Absolutely.